Good morning. Uh, as you heard, my name is Julius Covington. Um, I'd just like to thank all the leaders, deacons, um, just the opportunity to be able to speak to you guys this morning. Amen. Amen. So the song we just heard, uh, "War Cry." Is impact is, is powerful. If you sit down and actually read the lyrics, it's powerful. Uh, one thing I, I think of too, the intro. The intro was pretty accurate. I remember in uh, basic training, I think it was a day off, but it happened to be Memorial Day. We were just sitting around walking. American flag came by, like with squadron. Tinch hut. He was like, okay, what's happening? But we weren't in uniform, but it was a it was a retired colonel sitting there. And we're like, okay, well he's a retired colonel. He said, that's two, three, four, and we was just walking with the flag and we got included in the parade. I was like, okay, I, I didn't think that was possible. <laughs> so we're out here in civilian closing, just regular clothes, marching up a storm. And it's hot as all get out. It was in San Antonio, Texas. And I'm like, okay, but it's just the what I'm relating that to is the reverence of the U.S. flag. Do we do that when we see God? Do we say, Squadron! Amen. What's happening? I see God over here. You know I see that? No, I don't, but... Ten hut. Right. Uh, two, three. Are we marching? Are we included in that parade? Amen. Civilian clothes or not? Right? The title of the message this morning... Go ahead and write it down. Is the invisible war? Mm. Wow. Mm. And I say it's invisible because it's fighting going on around us right now that we don't yes. even see. Right. You may not realize it, but you're at war. Mm. Period. You may not wear fatigues. You may not eat at the mess hall every day. You may not be dodging physical bullets. Mm. But you're at war. Yes. And that's a fact. Yes, it is. And unfortunately, it happened from the time we were born, and it's going to keep happening to the time we die. <laughs> and we're going to always be in that constant war. Amen. So being at war, you have an enemy. <laughs> and you say, okay, I know who my enemy is. Do you know who your enemy is, really? Come on now. How many enemies do you think we have? One? You're crazy if you think we have one. Three. I'll name them, the world, the flesh, and Satan himself. Come on, now. I'll define them. The world, the dominant system around you. Can't escape it, you live here. Can't go to Mars. I don't, none of us have money to go to Mars. We haven't even reached Mars as with humans yet. And that's backed by funding. The flesh, the nature within you. That's another one of your enemies. And Satan himself. Definition of Satan is the opposition to God. And being an opposition means you're always an opposing force to another force. So Satan is always opposing God. Turn over to Ephesians 6, 12. Ephesians 6, verse 12. Amen. I hear the page turning. I'll give it a second. <laughs> it says, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. So, we already see that we have a struggle. A struggle can insinuate a conflict. Conflicts lead to war. War, as we just read, as we're going to read, is going to be everlasting. From individual to individual. Unfortunately, but that's how it is. Right? So the song we just heard, War Cry, is something that you do. It, it was something, it's, it's not really used now, but it was used back in the day when you had line against line and you had sword drawn against sword drawn against horse against chariot, staring at each other maybe 50 yards away, maybe 75, and you're getting ready to go into the heat of battle, so you give out that war cry. Yeah. I'm not gonna give a war cry, I gotta sing. <laughs> My voice. But, y'all know what a war cry is. You've seen yeah. Gladiator, you've seen movies where they line up and they run at each other and they, ah! <laughs> you got a war cry going on. People hear it across the battlefield. Yeah. But in order for a war cry to be relevant, there has to be a war. <laughs> You can sit 
your house and scream all day, that's not a war cry, you're just yelling. <laughs> You're not at battle with anything. Maybe, you're, yeah, you're battling those three things we talked about, but it's not at, at war with it. When you realize what at war with it means, and we really get to take into effect. So let's read about this. This war started long before we were even here. Come on. Turn over to Revelations 12, All right. Come on. 7 through 9. Come on. Come on. Come on this. Revelations 12, 7, verses 7 through 9. Amen. It says, Then war broke out in heaven. That's enough right there. Yeah. That, I'm, I'm going to keep reading, but we're going to stop right here real quick. What are we talking about? We're talking about heaven. And he says, Then war broke out in heaven. Wow. So why would war break out in heaven? Who do you think was responsible for that? We just read it earlier. His name was Satan. He's the opposition of God. He's the complete opposite of what God wanted. So therefore, if you have opposites, you're probably going to have war. You're going to have collision. Egos, right? Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. And the dragon and his angels fought back. We're going to stop right there too. So wait, 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 wait. We're in heaven. We got Michael and his angels. And then we got a dragon and his angel, Satan and his angel. How does Satan have angels? I thought we were all in heaven. Wow, well, weren't we meant to just all sit up there and worship God anyway? So somebody got ambitious and wanted to be God. Somebody wanted to do it their own way. He talks about it all the time. Golden Corral. Mr. Mark talks about it all the time. Somebody wanted that Golden Corral heaven style. I don't want to worship today. It's, uh, you know, it's sunny. We got pools of milk and honey and gold. I'd rather just dive into that. I'm worshiping at 2 a.m. is not on my, on my agenda right now. Let me, let me go tell God that. Hey, God, can we change it from 2 to maybe like 4.30? I need those extra like two hours of sleep or sunbathing. It's just my, pre my preference. And God's like, no. Well, that's what I want. Well, this is heaven. Okay, well, you know what, God, I just don't worry about you. I understand. Hey, y'all boys, this, uh, let me tell y'all what God told me, man. Tell me why we can't. Yeah, let's go jump him. And Michael's like, you want to jump my guy? Oh, but I got a whole band of people here. I got a whole band of people here, too. This is Satan. Yeah, I got a whole band, too. Okay, let's keep reading. But he was not strong enough, and they lost their place in heaven. Hmm. The great dragon was hurled down. The ancient serpent called the devil, or Satan, to give you clarification. Who led the whole world astray, he was hurled to earth and his angels with him. So we already have an army we're fighting. And we were tossed into this fight at birth. So when you hit this planet, you were fighting an army. You yourself won against a third of the angels. You outnumbered. That doesn't even seem like a fair fight to me. Right? All right. Since we just went over the fact that this war has already been here before we even thought about it, this fight is going to be continuous. All right. I don't know if you've seen the dance. I'm pretty sure I've seen that dance just now. And, and, and if you was really paying attention, the girls started. They started here on the on the ground, on the floor. Yeah. They were they were looking doing that makeup. I don't know what we're doing makeup, singing, looking in the mirror, Snapchatting, Snapchatting. on the phone, gossiping. gossiping. Mm, that's the world. But what happened at the end? They went back to it. Oh. There's a cycle. Oh. That war never stops. Oh, that's right. Yeah, it might stop when we die. Yeah, right now. But when I die, doesn't mean you die. That's fact. So that war is going to continuously go. First point. This is a spiritual warfare. Yes. Point blank. Period. It's an invisible war that we can't see. So if it's invisible, so we like, I can't put my hands and arms around. I can't grab this. It's a spiritual warfare. What that means? That means this battle is going on around us. And it's a battle that we can't see or control. And that's one of the battles. And then we have a battle going on in us right. that we can and cannot see, but we can control that battle. Uh -huh. 
So you have a battle around us that we can't see and can't control. And you have a battle that's in us that we can't really see, but we can see because of the outcome of what happens. Yeah, yeah. And we can control that outcome of what happens. Yeah. Turn to Galatians 5. Right. 16 through 17. Come on. Come on. Galatians 5, 16 through 17. This is talking about this war that yep. outside and inside. So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. That's one of your enemies right there, the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit. And we just talked about contradicting God, so Amen. Satan is a part of that contradiction to the spirit. Amen. And the spirit was in the spirit what is contrary to the flesh. And they are in conflict with each other so that you do not so that you are not to do whatever you want. Hmm. So I got my flesh and I have my spirit that are constantly in conflict with each other. And I feel like I'm making decisions, but I'm not doing what I want. Mm. But that's that control we was talking about on that inside, right? So we see that it's always a fight. It's always a struggle. And that the flesh and the spirit are always fighting. I want you to pay attention to this because they're always fighting to get our decisions attention. Mm. Come on now. So it's sub levels. Yeah, we have our body, we have our choices, but then we have decisions that lead to those choices. And the spirit and the flesh are, are fighting against each other, saying, hey, decision over here, hey, decision over here. Yes. They're trying to get the attention of your decisions. Come on now. Come on. So that then your decisions can either gratify the flesh or your decisions can either gratify the spirit. Mm. Go to 2 Chronicles 16, 9. Amen. Oh, good stuff, brother. Come on, great stuff, Second Chronicles 16, 9. I like to get scientific when I do things. I'm just a, a nerd like that. I like I like history, I like science, but we know that for every this is just a law. So it's not proven or anything. But for every action there's an equal and opposite reaction. So let's read something in 2 Chronicles 16, 9. Yes, talk about it, brother. For the eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. Right? And this was when he was talking to Asa. Yeah. And this is a confirmation. You have done a foolish thing, and from now on, you will be at war. Wow. But I want to focus on the top part. It said, for the eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. Mm -hmm. And we just said it was an equal and opposite, right? Yeah. Go to 1 Peter 5, 8. Come on. Come on. Come on. First Peter chapter 5, verse 8. So we know that the eyes of the Lord are going throughout the land. And that's one track. It says, verse, verse 8, it says, be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Wait, 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 wait. Hold on. I didn't get that. I got the eyes of the Lord searching for people's whose hearts are for him. Uh, yeah. But then on the other side, yes. I got Satan yeah. walking around looking to devour somebody. That's right. Equal and opposite reaction. Hey. Yeah. He's, a, he's opposing God. God's up there searching. He's like, well, I'm going to search with a bigger flashlight. Yeah. God's like, well, I'm going to get a, a bigger flashlight. Well, I'm going to get a bigger flashlight. <laughs> I'm looking for people. Yeah. And God's like, yeah, I'm looking for people. Come on, Jesse. Yeah, man. Man. But the only way God's going to find you, just said it, is if your heart is committed to it. Come on. That's it. It didn't say anything about it. Satan. It just said, be alert and of sober mind. It didn't say, it didn't list your vulnerabilities right here. He's just looking for you. Maybe he'll catch you slipping, maybe not. He's looking. God only sees you if your heart is looking for him. Come on. 
Hello. Come on. Amen. So that left the point, even those two combined together to make the point, it's up to us going back to that controlling of the war on the inside of us. Mm -hmm. It's up to us to be alert and of sober mind yes. to be able to recognize yes. that the devil's out there prowling around. Yes. Amen. 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 Right. Leads me to my next point. So we know it's a war and in war you have a commander in chief. Right. Also, another word for commander in chief or term is supreme commander. Overall, they control the strategy, they control what happens within the war. So, who is your commander in chief? Come on. Who do you call your supreme commander? Come on now. Come on. Who do you allow to pass down orders to you and you execute those orders? Come on. Come on. Amen. Good. That's a good question. Is it you? Do you pass down your own orders? Do you set a goal and not reach it? I know I do. I know I set many goals and not reach them. I'm not the only one. So that means I'm lazy. So if I'm my own commander in chief, will I execute my own plan sometimes? Hmm. Is it your friends? Do your friends ask you to do something and sometimes you don't do it? I know I do sometimes. I'd be like, ah, I forgot. I, I slipped. So is your commander in chief, your friend, asking you to execute this plan within this war and you forget to do it? Is it the preacher? Is your commander in chief the person up here just reading you the words and you're like, okay, hey man, but you never go home and touch the Bible. Nah, nah, not even look at it, like touch it. You can look at it. I, I, I've seen places where the Bible is there and I've looked at it and that thing is dusty as, I mean, it looked like it's been sitting there for 30 years. So you don't even touch it. It don't even have a fingerprint on it. Like you didn't accidentally lean over on the nightstand and click and you bumped it with your elbow. No, it's just dust. So is it the preacher? Come on. Wow. Go to 2 Timothy 4. Come on, JC. 2 Timothy 4, verses 3 through 4. It says, for the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. And said to suit, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. You know, we as a nation, it's sad, but we flock. I mean, flock. We run after this. Mm-hmm. Hatred, money, lust, jealousy, greed, lies, violence, and we, we seem to just tackle that and embrace it. Yeah. Yeah. I was looking last night, I, was, I said, let me make sure before I make this a point. And I looked at views, right? I, looked, I went on YouTube and I typed in the name. And I seen... Well, it hit me again. It's a rapper that died a couple of months ago named Nipsey Hussle. A lot of y'all heard about it, right? Y'all heard about that. He died. And that's all I heard about for days. I mean, days. Maybe months, actually. Maybe a month. For a long time. Paintings, songs, murals, memorials. I looked up last night, I typed his name in, all I typed in was Nipsey Hussle on YouTube. First video, 102 million views. 102 million people. I typed in Queen Naya, war cry. Wow. I said, yeah, this gotta be. 2.7 million views. Wow. You mean to tell me 100 million more people, 100 million more people know about Nipsey Hussle than they know about God? Come on now. Or, or is it the fact that 100 million more people want to know more about Nipsey Hussle than they want to know about God? Come on. Where, where, where do we go wrong at? Who, who is our commander in chief? Who do we want to listen to? We listen to the message of, not, not, nothing against him and his family or anything like that, but I heard somebody, I, said, I asked them, I said, why, do you, why did you post that on your Instagram? 
And he said, man, because he was doing good to the community. He was giving back. He was out there just being a, a saint, and he just got shot. I said, well, you ever heard of Jesus? <laughs> I was like, you, that, that goes back to that 102 million people that viewed that one video that came out six months ago. So you ever heard of Jesus? You know, he did the same thing and more. I don't see murals of him. I don't see posts of him saying we love you and we with you. And why is that? Because he's dead. But he rose. He's living to me. I'm talking about him. I don't see that. So, that being said, turn over to Matthew 7, 15 through 20. Come on, JC. Now, I'm not calling him this. This is just an overall scope, right? It says, watch out for false pro Matthew 7, verse 15 through 20. Watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. I'm going to stop there. So if you let a sheep into the hen, uh, into the play area where all sheep are, I, I just call it an area, but it's actually a wolf in clothing. You go to sleep, you won't have sheep that next morning. I, I, maybe one or two because the wolf might be full. But his goal is to infiltrate kill, get his fill, you come out in shock, oh my god, what happened? And by the time you do that, he split out the door and you're looking for what killed him. No, yeah. Yeah. He's gone. Now you're like, I just lost all these sheep. Well, you let the sheep in and you didn't examine the sheep. By their fruit, you will recognize them. Mm -hmm. Verse 16. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes? Mm. Hmm. Or figs from thistles? Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. Yes. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, by their fruit you will recognize them. And you say, what fruit are we talking about? Well, God, people don't grow fruit. Well, in Galatians 5, 22, you don't have to go there. You can write it down. Galatians 5, 22, he's talking about love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, faithfulness, gentleness, and all the likes. Those are the fruit that when we see people, we should see that. And to evaluate the people that we're talking about, if we're not seeing those in the people that we hang around, and we consistently see anger, envy, jealousy, discord, Come on now. we maybe need to reevaluate our friendships. Yes. We need to look inwardly and say, okay, are these the people that I'm hanging around that when somebody in the world dies, we recognize that more than we recognize Jesus who died to give us an opportunity to be in this world in the first place. That's right. Next point. It's a war. We got a commander in chief. It's a spiritual warfare. So the next point is what weapons and ammo are you using to fight this fight? Every fight is different. That's why I said at weapons and ammo to fight this fight. You can't take guns into a sea battle. You're not going to be effective. You can't roll a tank into the ocean and try to hit a submarine. Impossible. You can't take a soldier and throw him 20,000 feet in the air to try to shoot a plane out of the sky. Impossible. Your weapons have to be effective in the fight that you're fighting. And we're fighting a spiritual warfare. So are we relying on man, ourselves, to fight this battle? Even though we have a finite amount of energy, a finite amount of days on this planet, are we relying on the Holy Spirit? See, talking about the Bible, people like to say, you know, you know man, man wrote this Bible. If man wrote this Bible, we'd be the most glorious people in this Bible. If man wrote this Bible, I would not tell you that you need to change from your sin. I would say, well, when you wake up, you're great. You're excellent. You don't need to change a thing. You're perfect. Arguing? Got it down. Everybody does it. 
Stealing and lying and cheating? You're no different than that person. That person's amazing. So are you. Why would I write a Bible telling you, why would a man write a Bible telling you to worship God? Come on now. Come on. To give up the desires of your heart and worship God. I, I can't even fathom that. So why do we rely on ourselves to fight a fight that can only be fought with God? Come on now. Let me read you something here. It says, I was thinking, I was writing this down because I was thinking about my life before I became a Christian. I said, you can do everything right and still not defeat sin. You can read your Bible every day. You can pray every day. You can have a group of friends around you who will speak the truth and love to you on a regular basis every day. And at the end of the day, you can't depend upon yourself and what you do or the people around you to defeat sin. So we can live the most Christian laid out life, but we didn't defeat sin. You need, and I mean need with a capital N E E D, the power of the Holy Spirit. Right? The Holy Spirit enables believers to do what? they can't do to fulfill God's desires in our lives. We don't have that ability. We don't have that ability. That's why the Bible is written to tell us to worship God, to receive the Holy Spirit, to be in awe, to be in fear, because he's going to help you fight this fight. If, if it was written for us to be great and glorious, why would we need God? Right? Yep. Turn to Acts 2, Come on, bro. Okay. 37 through 39. We'll see how we obtain Come on, this Holy Spirit. Come on. Come on, bro. And I'm going to put something after that. I'm going to put something in perspective that I didn't, I never realized until I read this, making this message. I was like, wow. Okay, God, you, you, you something else. Yeah, he is. Acts, he is. <laughs> Amazing, actually. Yes, he is. Acts 2, 37 through 39. It says... When the people heard that this was um, Peter talking to the crowd after Jesus was crucified, and it says, when the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. So he just told us how to get that Holy Spirit. He said, repent and be baptized. So that's, that's that ammo. That's that clip we need to fight the Holy Spirit. We're, now we're fighting the fight with the right equipment. Yeah. Yeah. But turn over to Hebrews 4.15. And maybe, maybe I'm going to be the only one that, when I read this, I was shocked. I was like, oh, wow. I didn't realize that. Hebrews 4.15. And before I read it, we like to say, a lot of us like to say, well, I've been through a lot. I've been through, I've been through, pretty much through it all. Trust me. <laughs> You've been through it all. Yeah, I know. <laughs> sure. No matter how old we are in this room, yeah, you, you've been through it. Collectively, all of us in this room, we still ain't been through it. That's right. Come on. All right, in 4.15, in Hebrews 4, verse 15, let me read something here. It says, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weakness, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, in every way, he has been tempted in every way. When I read that, he says, has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Yes. Jesus was tempted in every way. Right. He's been through it all. I didn't put that in a perspective. I was like, well, Jesus wasn't that old. Jesus wasn't, his ministry wasn't even that old. He, he was a boy and then he died. He was 20 something. But the Bible just told me he went through it all. Yes. I'm sorry, yeah, I'm sorry I said, I said 30. I was thinking of 23. But 33. And he's been through it all. Yes. I was like, that's putting that into perspective. Right. Come on. We live a lifetime and don't go through it all. And this man went through it all and stayed sin free to show us that it's possible to go through it all. 
and stay sin free. That's right. That's right. And he wasn't doing it to like, I, Jesus wasn't doing this to brag or to boast, but doing this to show us that perfection is obtainable. Yes. 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 And that when I go, you have this opportunity to get this Holy Spirit, yes. to fight this good fight, That's right. to get this obtainable perfection. Because the only way that you're going to do it is with yes. the Holy Spirit. Yes. And we even know the, the, the main story to me is I have not been taken up on a mountain to see the whole, the, the highest I've ever been is Lookout Mountain. And I, you can see what, four states from up there, I think? And that's, that's the highest I've been. But we turn over to Matthew 4, 1 through 11. Mm. Come on now. Come on, Jason. And this takes away our excuse that, you know, well, Jesus was perfect. Yes. Jesus wasn't just, man. He was perfect. He was, just, he was the son of God, too. So, you know, he had to be perfect. So he just got done fasting. The man was tired. The man was hungry. He was human. He was showing his most human side to us. Mm -hmm. Satan came along. Doo -doo 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 -doo. <laughs> he said... The tempter came to him, uh, verse, we can pick up in verse 3. The tempter came to him and said, if you are the son of God, tell these stones to become bread. And we know Jesus was starving. 40 days, 40 nights. Yeah, he was hungry. Hungry. I've, I've gone like four hours and I'm, <laughs> I'm done. <laughs> I'm running in the kitchen. <laughs> Where's the food? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. My wife, my wife can say the same to her. Like she'll come on, I'll come on and she'll, hey, man, miss, hey, what's going on? Yeah. You were hungry like that? Yes. 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 It's only been four hours. Yes. Showing this most human state. We do a lot when, when, we're, when we don't think when we're hungry, when we're tired, when we're mentally distressed. It says his first line of defense, as it is written, Jesus answered, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him. See, earlier it said the tempter came. Now it's saying the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the son of God, he said, throw yourself down for it is written. He will command his angels concerning you and they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered, it is also written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in splendor and their splendor. All this will be given to all this I will give to you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. Jesus said to him, away from me, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him and the angels came and attended to him. That shows us right there that we can we can take away that Jesus was perfect excuse. <laughs> That he had the willingness to follow his commander in chief's orders. That's right. Follow God's orders. Yeah. He was equipped with the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. So he knew how to fight this fight that was approaching him. Yeah. Next point. To win this battle, because the war is won, by the way. That's right. Thank God. The war is won, but it's going to be always a war raging on for your soul. But to win this battle, because we have this personal battle, because like we said, once, once we're here, we were in it. And once we die, it doesn't stop with just us. It keeps going, but our battle's over. And it was how we responded to these things. Once to win this battle, we cannot continue to lie to ourselves. Amen. You say, well, I don't lie to myself. Come on. We love ourselves all the time. I haven't gained any weight. <laughs> nah, we straight. These mugs still, they fit. I haven't gained any weight. I'm not hurting anyone. Let me get a little piece of this. Ain't nobody ain't gonna notice that. That's a lie. Now, there's no sin different. But... The most dangerous lie, I think, of all is there's not really, it's not really a problem. You know, you tell yourself that. My finances aren't really a problem. Yeah, come on. You know, my marriage isn't really in trouble. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, my temper is not out of control. I'm, I'm fine. I don't, 
don't really get frustrated like that. It's not really a problem. I'm dealing with it. I don't speed. It's not really a problem. I, I don't listen to it. It's not really a problem. I, I try to listen to authority, but it's not really a problem. Mm-hmm. Lying to ourselves is the number one way to mess up our own lives. That's right. You know, the Bible says in 1 John 1, 8, you can write it down. Um, it says, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Yeah. Sin causes us to deceive ourselves and deception causes us to sin because we've believed every lie that we've told ourselves that there's not a problem, that it's not that big of a deal, that we so much do that, that we deceive ourselves into thinking, well, this can't really be sin, so I'm going to do it anyway. Right. And that's going to take us down the drain. Yep. So behind every self-defeating act in our life is a lie that we've grown to believe. Either we lie to ourselves mm-hmm. or we've believed one of Satan's lies. Right. The Bible says in Jeremiah 17, 9, right, you can write that one down, that our heart is deceitful above all things. Yes. So we have an amazing ability to lie to ourselves and just go with the flow. That's something that we need to change. We need to stop minimizing our lies. We need to stop minimizing our behavior. We need to stop excusing our behavior. We can't keep tolerating our own behavior. So that way when something happens, we try to blame that on, we, we got the gun so loaded, ready to blame that on somebody else that we don't even look back on ourselves and say, well, that was a lie I was telling myself the whole time. I've started believing it. Help us out, bro. Coming to an end here, wrapping up. It says, <coughs> to stop defeating yourselves, doing all those things, self-defeating behaviors that cripple your ability to follow Jesus faithfully, you have to stop deceiving yourself. Yeah. So to stop defeating ourselves, we have to stop deceiving ourselves. Jesus said, when you know the truth, the truth will set you free. But even back to Acts 2, repenting and being baptized, the truth is meant to make us feel very miserable. And that's just hands down. The truth should break us to the point that we said, wow, I did that to Jesus. I, I feel miserable. Miserable is a feeling of feeling horrible, feeling like that's on you. Because that is on us. We take responsibility. We put Jesus up there on that cross. He died for us to have a new life. And yes, we don't take, some of us don't take that. Some of us would, like we said, rather be a part of that 100 million that follows somebody like Jesus Ooh, come on. who follows the probably tries to follow an example of what Jesus did because you can you can go purchase a Bible from Barnes and Nobles for nine ninety nine <laughs> instead of picking up and purchasing that same Bible from Barnes and Nobles for nine ninety nine reading it and applying it to our lives Amen. that's for campus singles married young professionals all of us Amen. that we need to look at ourselves and say what example am I am I really gonna follow. Yeah. And to end it here, I want to say we all know that, we all know that saying, you win some, you lose some, right? I, I heard that my whole life. I, used to, I think my first baseball game I lost, I was nine years old. I probably won like 130 in, in a row. And I was hitting homers and everything. Pow, pow. And my dad was like, well, son, you win some, you lose some. Getting older. I was like, yeah, that is. You're right. You win some, you lose some. I, I know that. But you can't go to God and say, well, God, you win some, you lose some. Because God's going to say, son, daughter, I don't lose some. That's I, I, I don't lose any. If you go back up in Revelation, while he's sitting there talking to you, what we just read at the start, you realize Satan revolted against me, right? Yes, sir. Did I lose? No. I didn't even fight and I didn't lose. (laughs) Oh, well, you got a point. Michael fought for him and he didn't even lose. So we have to really... With this whole war, this whole spiritual warfare, this whole 
inner battle, outer battle, we have to rely on God because God does not lose. Right. And that's a fact. Right. Yeah. To God be the glory. Amen. Amen.